This morning, I would like to uh, continue on a theme I've been working for a long period, and that is uh, the working with uh, the qualities of, uh, of non-conflict in our lives. And, uh, and I've been talking on many different aspects on it. Last week, I went in particular about aspects of the body, speech and the mind, how they are three separate divisions and need they need attention, taking care and attention to each of these aspects and uh, cannot be uh, considered uh, as one unit. Mm. So, uh, and this week now I will talk about uh, the qualities of uh, right view and also these aspects of what we should be developing by our bodily actions, by our by our speech and by our mental uh, uh, thoughts and so forth, mental actions, thoughts, intentions. <clears throat> so in particular, with right view, um, I, I want to draw uh, the great words of uh, Tara Sari, uh, Pratera Sariputta, uh, who's uh, the Lord Buddha's, we say, is uh, the the, uh, the, the general of the Dharma, he's Lord Buddha, s sits on the right side of Lord Buddha. So he's, uh, he's foremost in, uh, in wisdom. His quality of wisdom is almost on par with the Buddha, but not exactly, because there are quite a few many occasions where he is not sure and he does uh, go to have consultations with the Lord Buddha to uh, clarify uh, certain aspects on Dharma. But himself being a very excellent teacher on many occasions, he does teach the monks and the laity. And so his teachings are very, very precise and sometimes uh, not elaborate. And uh, so where it is not elaborate, I will, I will uh, ec uh, expound on that, uh, uh, um, try to explain it a bit better. But in the time of the Lord Buddha, these great monks uh, did speak with precision and also there was a lot of understanding in particular with right view which uh, is uh, an, an ancient uh, dialogue which is not used much now in the modern context which is uh, I, f I think my opinion it is that and it's also not <coughs> stated much in the scriptures and that's because uh, it is it is well known in uh, ancient India this was considered aspect of right view and uh, you know it's because it, it also involves their ancient Brahmin beliefs as well but it was distorted they understood these uh, scriptures so it was uh, that's why when sorry Buddha says uh, and in his opening lines in explaining right view one of right view he said friends in one what in one, in that way, noble disciple, one of right view, whose view is right, who has unwavering confidence in a dharma, who has arrived at the true dharma. And then the monks would ask, uh, it would be very good, uh, uh, Venerable, if you were to explain uh, uh, the meaning of this statement. And thus, uh, when friends, a noble disciple of who understands the the unwholesome and the root of the unwholesome and the wholesome and the root of the wholesome. And those two lines is understanding good qualities that have no remorse, no regret, and understanding their, the causes for them to come about, which is their roots. Um, that's what we call root mula, is that that's what creates them in the first place. Um, and uh, so, uh, and, and, it's, and this is a dual pair, and there's on the other aspect, uh, the wholesome, which is the good qualities and uh, positive aspects where there's no remorse, no regret in the mind. And this is the benefit of developing wholesome, as we can see. So I've just added that as a bit of understanding for you. And then he further on goes on to say, in, in that way, he is one of right view, who whose view is straight, who understands, who has unwavering confidence and has arrived at this true dharma. And what, friends, is the unwholesome and what is the root of the unwholesome and what is wholesome and what is the root of the wholesome? So there he now introduces the first section, uh, 
which he's talking about, the wholesome. So he's gradually going through the whole sequence, what he just st stated at the very beginning. And it's in very short and not in, in detail. So, uh, and this, this list in particular, we're, we're all aware of it. We're going, oh no, here he goes again. We're talking about virtue. I've heard this so many times and not again this same list over and over again. But actually, I will be adding on to that list because there are refinements to that list which are also not much taught. And I think they're very good to uh, consider and to recollect them in detail. So we will just go them in, in uh, the uh, short form as it's been uh, uh, taught here. Killing living beings is unwholesome. Taking what is not given is unwholesome. And miscon misconduct of sensual pleasures is unwholesome. So this pertains to our bodily actions. And, this, and the second one pertains to our verbal actions. False speech is unwholesome. Malicious speech is unwholesome. Harsh speech is unwholesome. And gossip is unwholesome. So that is the four qualities that pertain to unwholesome speech. And then the last division being that of the mind, and that is covetousness is unwholesome. And covetous meaning longing or desire for particular other people's properties. That's what is meant by the word covetousness, which is an old English word a lot of you might not know the definition of. Ill will is unwholesome and wrong view is unwholesome. This is called the unwholesome. So there it's uh, quite in uh, condensed form. And now we go to the other aspect. And what is the root of the unwholesome? Greed is the root of the unwholesome, hate is the root of the unwholesome, and delusion is the root of the unwholesome. This is called the root of the unwholesome. So when we see that, uh, we can, uh, can understand that this is what's causing these um, uh, unwholesome conducts, is because they, are, they have these three roots. So if we don't have these roots, then it's not possible to, to create these unwholesome conducts. So a lot of people have a misunderstanding saying, oh, oh, not to kill, so I don't kill. But actually, one, what should be one looking at is the roots that are there. And there are these three roots, as he says. There is greed, hatred, and delusion. And for the most reason why people do commit the first unwholesome act is because of hatred. There's this uh, negativity in the mind or anger. And again, later in this... In this uh, uh, Talk, I will go into detail about these 10 uh, unwholesome qualities and also the, the direct opposite of wholesome qualities. So what is wholesome and abstains from killing living beings is wholesome. Abstain from taking what not is given is wholesome. Abstain from misconduct of sexual pleasures is wholesome. Abstain from false speech is wholesome. Abstain from malicious speech is wholesome. Abstain from harsh speech is wholesome. Abstain from gossip is wholesome. Uncoveredness is wholesome. Non-ill will is wholesome. Right view is wholesome. This is called the wholesome. So that is all good. Everything that all those 10 are definitely uh, positive forces in our life. If we are abstain from those things, we're creating much good in ourselves and much happiness and uh, not uh, have any causes for regret or remorse in our lives. And then now he goes on to, again, in the same sequence order. So he's teaching in a very sequent, methodical way. And this is what the beauty of Theravada and Buddhism is that it's taught in a very methodical way. And uh, the monks have to learn it by step by step in a mythology. And it has to be taught mythology for understanding Dharma. And because Dharma is... Uh, like condition phenomena has causes and conditions, so too these beautiful dharmas have causes and conditions. They're not without causes and conditions. <clears throat> and what is the root of wholesome? Non-greed is the root of wholesome. Non-hatred is the root of wholesome. And non-delusion is the root of the wholesome. This is called the root of wholesome. And again, we see if we have uh, no, no, no hatred in the mind, then, uh, then there's no cause for uh, or anger, then that would reduce the potential of harming other beings, wouldn't it? Because we have no hatred, no anger. So then we're taking away that quality. So then if we're abstaining from killing, 
they're also we're, we're acting on the other aspect. So if we're abstaining from that, also we're having effect on the fundamental root that is creating that action to take place in the first place. So if I'm abstaining, that means that action of the body, that we don't do that, then we go into that root, and that root inside us, in our mind, we might still think of wanting to harm and kill, but we've made that vow, no, I won't do that action by the body, which the Lord would have said is not beneficial, even though we're on a level of thinking it. And this is where it's abandoned on the level of the bodily level. It still is on the level of the mind, but again, we'll go into detail how we band it on the level of the mind. So each division is a separate division, and we have to work methodically with it to understand precepts properly. And now there's a lot of understanding precepts where we're working on the mind always, but actually we're not giving focus, attention to the body, our actions of our body, and being mindful of that, or we're not giving attention to our speech and not being mindful of that. We're not directing those different avenues. And if we're not doing something by our bodily actions or our verbalizations, then we, on, then, then we have much more wisdom to understand what is happening in the mind because we're already training in sati sampajanya, clear comprehension, because we're constantly thinking about our bodily activity and our verbal activity. If we're maintaining that constant, that is an incredible form of uh, sati. It's the most powerful form of sati. People now talk about sati in a sense of being mindful, touching things, moving one's hands, turning one's neck, which is in the classic teachings of satipatthana. But that's a very high level. That's not a fundamental level. It's someone on a very high level who's got very much a high standard of virtue. So the four trainings of satipatthana is someone who's established in dharma, who's established in right view. But here we're talking about the fundamental aspects of right view and we're establishing that. <coughs> And thus, sorry, put it concludes with saying, when the noble disciple thus understands the unwholesome and the root of the unwholesome and the wholesome and the root of the unwholesome, he entirely abandons the underlying tendency of lust, which is, uh, we're looking at this tendency of lust, which is rooted in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the, the, the root of, of the quality of the unwholesome root of raga, the base of raga or, or tanha. So there's that root, the root of, uh, uh, of desire. He abolishes the underlying tendency of aversion, and which, we, which again is another way of saying uh, hatred, you know, negatively pushing away aversion. So he's abandoned that. So in the first two statements, he's saying this is what is, when one understands, one can, one has the potential to abandon these qualities. And he exaggerates the underlying tendency of view and conceit I am. And by abandoning ignorance, so the view, view conceit I am and abandoning ignorance, which is on the level of uh, delusion, moha. So then on that level, we're looking at uh, understanding that when, we, when we're acting, proactively acting in keeping virtue, this is what we're working on. We're working on these, we're working on these roots. We're putting pressure on these tendencies that each human mind has, each unenlightened mind has. There's not a human being that doesn't have greed, hatred or delusion. It's impossible, the Lord Buddha says, you know, because they're not enlightened. The only person that's free from these stains is an arahant. So even someone on the level is very highly attained, maybe, you know, uh, with, with having very little uh, uh, hatred, a very, uh, very powerful monk, well-trained monk, still will have these tendency because he hasn't finished the work, as we say. <clears throat> so, and then the concluding other section of that, he here and now makes an end of suffering in that way to a noble disciple is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dharma and has arrived at the true Dharma. So then we're just looking at pan, Pajanati, this quality of understand. We understand there is the wholesome and the unwholesome. We understand that and we understand that they have roots pertaining to them. And then once we understand that, we're using that understanding always, that knowledge always is pre present. So for example, if we're doing something still unwholesome, that shows we don't understand. So this is why he's saying by just merely understanding, we can abandon it. And this goes in line with actually the first noble truth where we have to understand suffering. So if we understand suffering and the Lord Buddha says, then it's naturally, if we completely understand suffering, it's a natural uh, knock-on effect. It's like a domino theory. Once you hit one domino down, they all follow. 
So this fundamental aspect, once we establish right view, clearly understand it and train in right view, then it's like a domino theory, it knocks down and then the whole eightfold path comes into being. This whole eightfold path cannot go wrong because it's fundamentally going the right course of action. Because it, it is a conditional cause for right intention as well. And as we know, if we understand the Eightfold Path, but this talk's not about the Eightfold Path. Now I'll go into detail about those, uh, those aspects of wholesome quality, unwholesome qualities in another particular sutta. And this time it's Lord Buddha talking to a group of monks. And of course, even though it's uh, mentioning monks, it's probably most like there are some lay people there, but usually it's, uh, the suttas always address bhikkhus, it's like that, or venerables and so forth, but meaning that maybe this mostly is this gathering of monks on that occasion. <clears throat> bhikkhus, possessing ten qualities, one is deposited in how, as if brought there, what ten? Now, I was a bit reluctant to say that, but I thought, well, hey, this is what the Lord was saying, so it should be said. It said, you know, a lot of people don't want to hear that word, ooh, you know, I don't want to hear about that. Well, I don't want to think about that. Well, I actually should think about it. That's why he's saying we should think about it because the very fact is that you're afraid, you don't want to think about it, you don't want to hear about it, it's showing that actually that maybe you are doing something not right. Because if you are doing good things and wholesome things, positive things, then if you hear the word, you have no fear. But what instead you have is that quality of loving kindness for those who still are immature and not practicing well and might have as a consequences of their actions go into that direction. And of course we can't pull them out of that situation because beings are the hair and owner of their karmas and so forth. So if that's what they've generated, we can only have uh, 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 these four Brahma Viharas such as having loving kindness, compassion for them. And this is where we can maybe give some support for them. So then if we do hear it, we have to check ourselves. Oh, I am a little bit scared. Great, great. So you should be scared because it's not a very pleasant state to be in. And, and, you know, and, in, in, and in most religions, they talk about it. So it's quietly understood by cross-border most religions. But the way they see about, um, uh, about their idea behind it, the philosophy and the, and the principles may be different compared to Buddhism, but there is this mutual understanding of it. It's just now because religion is not very popular now, and Buddhism is taught in a very circular way, that when they hear this, they, they want to ignore it straight away. And why is that? Because they're on a level of, of uh, intellectualising Buddhism. They haven't really taken it to heart. So therefore they just think, oh, that doesn't apply to me. And this I'll go into detail. This is part of wrong view, that people are not paying attention to these aspects. And here, so sorry, I know this is the Lord Buddha now going into detail. And here someone destroys life. And then he goes into a beautiful simile of that. He is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. So this is what I was saying before, that this is the reason why we're harming or killing is because it's rooted in usually in hatred. So all this, we're looking at the quality of hatred. But it's not saying that's just the only reason we kill. There are crimes of passion, as we say. So when we watch movies, you know, uh, you know to... to uh, a, vi a villain and uh, the hero fighting for the damsel in distress and uh, the hero kills the villain, you know. But of course, you know, there are consequences for killing the villain, you know. You know, even though he's a baddie, but there is consequences of that. He's not free of karma. So, uh, and the Lord Buddha does not promote that someone, if someone's a bad person to actually, uh, to harm them, but to uh, look at containing them and trying to... Uh, uh, rehabilitate them. This is, uh, this is, and this we're seeing in modern society where we've taken away the, the killing penalty of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the penalty of hanging a person, so forth. In a lot of modern cultures, but instead of looking to rehabilitate, rehabilitate them and see them to see that they're wrong, transgressing their wrongdoings and make amends. So that's uh, creating a good positive fit. And the second one, he takes what not is given. He steals the wealth and property of others in the village or forest. So uh, in the forest, this is quite an interesting statement. So it's just saying that's how broad it is. For example, in ancient times, the king owned the forest. So if uh, someone went in to, to chop down a large tree, then uh, he, would be, uh, he would be persecuted. And this happened also in Europe in, uh, in, the, uh, in the dark ages where there was a shortage of wood, people would... Uh, would try to get timber from the forest, and uh, if they were found out by the by the, the the king or the local authorities, that person would be taken from the village and be punished heavily for that, because that was the woodlands of the king. 
So that's interesting. And it's also we have laws like that, you know, like public forest and things like that, that you, you can do certain things. So it, anyway, it, you can see it is in the context of modern society. There is national parks, you can't touch it, but there is public forests where you can do all sorts of things, which I feel is a bit I don't agree with because uh, if you go see them, you know, people do all sorts of things there and it's not so pleasant. <clears throat> So then the third aspect of the, the, the bodily goes into detail, which is engages in sexual misconduct. And here he has sexual relations with a woman or who a one who is protected by their mother or their father or by both or brother, sister or relatives who are protected by their dharma or who have a husband whose viol violation entails uh, penalty or one with one who's already uh, engaged. So it's a beautiful classic conservative uh, list uh, relating to ancient India. Of course, you know, there's been a lot of changes in our society, but still we can, we can take the spirit of what the meaning there is to give us a guideline. We can consider that and work with that. And even in modern society, he's got one excellent point there, whose violation entails penalty. So there you go, there's something there that's saying something about modern society. There's some things that are not accepted sexual behavior so it's uh, so we have to consider that that's part of in context of modern society and so uh, we we can uh, look at that another aspect he does who's protected by their dharma so that means somebody let's say somebody's on a meditation retreat he's you know keeping keeping the eight precepts the brahmacharya so that's what it's in that context so uh, one is uh, uh, and uh, we can see that is an excellent list to give us a bit of understanding. And then we can, even though we can use our own um, understanding as well, and there's another aspect of it that's very good, which is uh, who are protected, or I should say who are protected by their mother and father. And this has got to do with somebody who is a uh, young age. This is also it's probably not the, he's still too young to be involved in such activity, don't really understand and so forth. And this is, we see there's a lot of problems with abortions because of that, because of unwanted uh, you know, something of the consequences of that. So we can see uh, uh, the, the great wisdom and maturity in those qualities of understanding it in a deep, profound way. And also uh, uh, one who is already engaged and is dealing with marriage, so that's also talking about somebody who's committed in a relationship, so that's, again, in a directly talking about adultery. You know, it's, uh, you have one relationship, but you go to another one, and then you're breaking both relationships up, and it causes a lot of and maybe children involved, and also. So we can see that we are trying to understand, and why we do those things is because of this, the root of desire. It's motivated by desire. So, and therefore, by not doing that, we're reducing our desires. We're getting a perspective on our desires and, and seeing them in a proper perspective for our more happiness and peace. So now we go into the second division of, uh, right, of, of, of speech. And then he speaks falsehood. He is summoned at, to a council, to assembly, to his relative's presence, or to a guild, or to a court, and question as a witness thus. So good man, tell what you know. They're not knowing, he says, I know, or not. Or knowing, he says, I do not know. Or not seeing, he says, I see. Or not seeing, he says, I see. Thus he consciously speaks falsehood for his own end, for another's ends, or for some trifly world end. And that's an excellent how it summarises it there, for one's own end, and how true that is. And when we, when we, when we do speak falsehood for our own ends, you can see that one usually is based in desire. You know, we have desire for something and someone's uh, stopping us from doing it, so we do it anyway because we want to do it. And then when we're asked, if, did we do such things, then of course we lie because it's not approved. And there we can see like that. And another aspect is uh, when we're doing it for another ends is we can see maybe possibly rooted in hatred. We don't like someone and so how do we, how we gain more of this feeling we don't like and we get their friends on our side. So we tell things about them. So then their friends will also not like them. So we can see these qualities of how you can put it into a reality context for another person's end. Or for a trifling world end, and that might be, you know, like just on a worldly level, it might be on, you know, delusion, on a level of delusion, on a worldly end for, you know, like a... Uh, uh, 
thinking it doesn't matter, you know, having this uh, delusive nature that oh, it doesn't matter, it's not important, but then it is important, you know, and, and then we realise, oh, I should be more careful. And now we uh, go to the second aspect, he speaks div- divisively, uh, uh, this creating division, a speech that creates division. So this is an excellent list which is rarely spoken about, rarely gone into detail. And, uh, and this is very good to go into detail and to reflect on it because this is our training as Buddhists in our aspect of sati. So we should from time to time just go over and reflect on it and get, put it into some context to see if we understand it, such as I've been doing it, seeing the roots also, where, where, where actually what is the motivation for doing that. And that motivation is the root. So as, as Sariputta said in his beautiful statement, there is the unwholesome and the root of the unwholesome. So unwholesome cannot exist without its roots, you see. So then we're getting a very deep understanding and it's very exact. When we, when we really thoroughly investigate it, we see the great wisdom of Sariputta is so precise. When you first hear it, it's so boring, so simple, but actually when you really appreciate it, when you very much investigate it for your mind, you say, oh, he was so precise, razor sharp, just to the point. You know, and this is this is the problem with a lot of Buddhism. It's so sharp, it's so to the point that we mis misguide it, misunderstand it, because we haven't investigated enough. And that's what I hope this Dharma talks all about. And the monks, what we are supposed to do is to go it into detail and to explain it into detail as we understand it from our teachers and so forth. So, having heard something here, he repeats it elsewhere in order to divide those people from these. Or having heard something elsewhere, he repeats it to those people in order to divide them from those. So that's excellent one. So then you first you'll hear, you hear something here and you take it over there and you tell other people in another centre. So you're in this centre and then you go to another centre and they know the same people. So some people that come here go to another centre and so then maybe somebody here who's a friend of another centre over there, you divide because you don't like that person. So it could be at your workplace, I'm just using the centre as an example, probably you wouldn't happen at centre because we're all good people, we would never think of doing such things. But it's more, let's say, in your workplace where people are very uh, motivated by virtuous conduct, then you go to one workplace or then you go to your, your other locality, like you have maybe two sites where you do work and there's two working parties, and that's what people do, they do create divisions. And you can see that's happening a lot in society. So, uh, <clears throat> and then in order to divide them from those, thus he is one who divides those who are united and creates division, one who enjoys factions, rejoices in factions, delights in factions, speaks of words that create factions. And this is what we can see. Let's say, for example, in the workplace, the boss is very strict and people are not happy with the boss and then they create a little division where they protest and so forth. And they, they break uh, the thing, they say no, no, no. And then because of that consequence, they might even lose their job if they don't have any government support that's supporting their, their protest. So, uh, so therefore, uh, what it's saying is that if we are going to address an issue, we have to do it in a way that all parties involved are there, are present, and we can do it in a very civil and uh, in a very harmonious way. So not to cause... Uh, the, uh, 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 di- uh, divisions or uh, are not able to address the issue pros- pos- uh, properly. Yeah, and this is very important, we're addressing issues properly. So then we can see uh, he is one who enjoys factions. Again, we can see why is he enjoying that. There might be a root again, and this could be cause possibly of hatred because this is because we're dividing people motivated by that. Or, or maybe purely desire, just out of pure fun, wanting to just... Uh, uh, see people get a joy because some people do get a joy out of hurting people you know they don't do it in ill will they actually like to put people down and they get a lot of enjoyment they have a big laugh over it and things like that so there's that style which is a very evil form of desire and getting enjoyment and not recognizing the good of others or the potential good of others or those who are who have done no harm and I can say that for let's say people with disabilities in the, in the, in the way back in the past there was a lot of uh, discrimination for people with disabilities and make fun of them and so forth like that. And yesterday a lady came up to me, she's a short dis- lady, totally disabled, mental and handicapped, and she says, where's the toilet? So I had to open up the facilities for her. And straight away what arose in my mind was, was compassion. I noticed it straight away. I was being very mindful of what I was doing. 
and doing some uh, preparations and suddenly it's oh beautiful and this is the beauty when we are peaceful in activities and we challenge the situation we we'll say no i won't be cruel I won't be like that we see these beautiful qualities of dharma rise in our minds so we're we're developing with this healer is a very very important thing actually and people don't go far enough in it and don't give it enough uh praise which is sad so then that way we're seeing we're uniting people and this is very important all kinds of people and trying to find a way of maturing our societies he speaks harshly, this is the, uh, the third part of uh, the division of uh, speech. He speaks harshly, he utters words such as rough, hard, hurtful to others, offensive to others, bordering on anger, unconducive to concentration. There we go, it ends up with unconducive to concentration. This is what I was saying before, leading to regret, remorse. When we're doing these uh, unwholesome activities, they create regret and remorse. And then when we sit for meditation, we can't even concentrate the mind. It's impossible because there's no basis of peace in our mind. So we're really considering that. So then uh, we can see what roots would they be in. And then we can see, well, rough and hard speech were most likely to be in hatred and aggression and aversion. But also it can be sometimes out of love. You know, let's say if we love someone and they've hurt us. So it's uh, like, again, crimes of passion, so to speak. So it could be out of love and we're hurting the one we love. As I say, the old famous thing, we hurt the one we love. And uh, we do that. We might say something very malicious and nasty because, uh, because of the, the strong attachment we have to that person, because they're not behaving the way we want them to. And this is also showing us maturity. This seal is showing us mature population with our loved ones, respect for them, not to get carried away. So there's so many beautiful qualities in speech. And speech is, goes into very detail because that is where it all, that's where we all fall apart in our speech. So speech is really what we say is what we think. And how to prove this, in the, and when we're absorbed in, the, in the high levels of concentration, this is called the Aryan silence. And what happens is vitaka and vichara it totally shuts down. And this quality of vitaka and vichara, these Pali words meaning applied and sustained thought, is what you need to conceptualize and have verbalization. So to think before you say something, you have to think first. If you don't think, you don't consider it, you can't say it. So therefore, uh, that's why a lot of people, they're not too sure what they're saying. They're confused and they say you know, wrong things or say it you know, the wrong way, things like that. And in particular, children, when you ask children, they're all confused when you put them under pressure because they, their four patterns are not really developed. They still don't know how to address the situation. They might say something silly. So it just shows the maturity is not there. So then what we're seeing there is when, when we're, um, we understand that, then that way we will be careful in our speech because we know we have to think about it first. So then that way we're, we're maturing in our thought patterns and our thought processes. We're considering it very carefully. And then afterwards we, afterwards we consider it again, those thought patterns. So even though we've said it already, we might even have a review and think, now, was that good how I said it? No, it could have been a bit better. That was actually a bit, it's like playing basketball. You're going for the, you're trying to get the ball in the ring and you go, oh, I missed. And you're saying, well, maybe I can change my technique a little bit. Maybe if I get a bit closer, hold the ball this way, hold it that direction, try again. And you, until you get the right technique, right approach, how you present yourself, how you present your speech and so forth. So it's an ongoing process. So speech is an ongoing process in training in good mental culture, yeah? So then if we have good mental culture, we're developing wisdom. Yeah? So if we're not keeping precepts and developing, then there's no potential for wisdom, no potential for wisdom, no potential for wrong right view, no potential for right view, no potential to actually understand Dharma at all. And that's terrible. That's terrible. Imagine that, a life with no Dharma, no wisdom. It's terrible. So he's full of longing. So now that ends the, uh, no, one last one, sorry. <clears throat> He indulges in idle chattel. This is the last one. And this one also, again, is very uh, not uh, understood much in, in clarity. Idle chatter, you know, or nonsensical uh, speaking. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, um, this is good to understand it in its proper context. And again, he gives a lovely list for this. He speaks at the... He speaks at the improper time. So this is, again, uh, the unwholesome qualities of idle chatter. He speaks falsely. He speaks what is unbeneficial. He speaks contrary to the Dharma 
and the discipline. At the improper time, he speaks such words that are worthless, unreasonable, rambling, and unbeneficial. So that's an excellent <laughs> list. It's complete. So then we're just thinking when, when we're, you know, like catching up with friends, we're chit-chatting a little bit, and we can see those who are very refined, you know, like, hi, how are you, how are you doing, and stuff like that. If they're doing it very skillful, it's only chit-chat, but if it's done very skillful, it creates a positive feeling for people. And you can observe it when some people are very mature in their speech patterns and the way they address things. They visit someone who's sick in hospital and say, uh, hope you're getting well, how are things going, you know, uh, at least you have your right hands to, uh, to still write, you know, giving positive, you know, import and things like that, you know, not making them worry about their illness too much. And in this way, we're, we're developing skill and, and chit-chat, you know, as we say, just normal talk. So it's not saying, this is not saying, no, don't get involved in nonsensical speech. Again, a lot of people see it like that, so I won't speak uh, nonsensical. Or speaking contrary to the Dharma and the discipline. And this is a very important point. This is the only one where it addresses that issue there. Because that's what happens in, in idle chatter, is that we don't give any more, we forget about the Dharma then. We just have fun. And basically, that's what it's basically saying. It's, it's just play talk, you know, you know which, which we... Uh, and you see children still learning communication skills and they play all sorts of games, role models. They're using this one a lot. And, you know, they're still young, so that's why sometimes they pretend, I'm the doctor, you're the nurse, and this and that. And they play role model games. And, uh, and we can do that with... Uh, now we have the Sunday school, and that's what they're doing, giving them a lot of role model games giving a lot of interaction to understand Dharma, and that's excellent what this centre is providing for children. So that's why now we're seeing many generations of very mature, intelligent uh, Buddhists. And because of that, you're getting these very um, high-end Dharma talks with a lot of uh, knowledge and information skill, how to deal with that. So you're, you're, you're promoting that in, in the centre and promoting it worldwide. And so, so uh, for after this talk, there will be also uh, question and answers from overseas, so that's how much um, uh, powerful presence this uh, centre has. So and now we go into the third division um, of, uh, of the mind, and he is full of longing. Uh, anabija is a Pali word for that, and uh, it's full of longing, sense of covetousness, and this old word covetousness uh, explains it very clearly, and he puts it into three main points. He has long for wealth and property of others. And finally, oh, what belongs to another may be mine. So purely just jealous, you know, like, oh, he's got, he's got the latest Ferrari. Oh, I wish I had that. You know, this old classic, that's what it's saying to. Oh, may what belongs to another be mine. It's not stealing, but it's that wish, that intention. Oh, yes, you know, the best iPhone. Oh, I wish I had that. You know, this thing that we say, I wish I had that. I wish I had that. Oh, you know. And, it's, and it, you know, if you're not careful, that's going on all the time in the mind. And, and this is the one that we have to really pay attention to because this is the one where the Lord Buddha says is the one that's going to prevent us from having mindfulness. Okay? So there's a particular thing the Lord Buddha says, Ida bika ve gaya gaya no pasa viyati ata pati sampajano satima vina loke abhija domana sang abhija. And that is uh, one's uh, having longing for the world, has not put away, put away his longing. If you haven't put away your longing, you cannot have, you cannot have these qualities, atapi, which is uh, developing of uh, strong effort in the Dharma practice and developing mindfulness, establishing firm mindfulness in the present moment. It's impossible, he says, it's impossible. And this is why when people say when they meditate, oh, so many thoughts, Arjun, my thoughts thinking about that and that and that. But next time people are going to ask me that, I'm going to be quite, uh, I'm going to be quite, uh, I would say, um, I will interrogate them. So be careful you're going to ask me that now, because I'll interrogate, I want to know what kind of thoughts you're having in detail. <laughs> and this is how we have to be. We have to be a bit firm, you know, it says, what are my thoughts? You've got to interrogate yourself sometimes. Why is my mind wondering? What thoughts am I thinking? Okay? Where are they going? Okay? And usually it's about sila. It's about issues with sila, okay? If there are no, if our sila is good, complete in these three levels, you should have no, you should not have a wandering mind. It's guaranteed. You're ready. You're ready. Because you've put away longing, okay? And this is going on all the time, you know? And it's not just lay people. Monastics have it too, you know? It's something that, you know, <laughs> it has to be constantly refining our sila and our behaviour always. So it's something that we have to work with. 
So then um, we'll go into the ne next aspect. He has a mind of ill will, intentions of hate. Thus, uh, may these beings be slain, slaughtered, cut off, destroyed, annihilated. So that's a beautiful list. It's just a saying what we've, we're not actually doing the act, but this is what we're thinking. So we can see how it's very connected to the act of killing. This is what is on the level of the mind. So if we stop doing that on our physical actions, that will reduce greatly in the mind because we're not doing that, we're not promoting that. But if we not stop doing that action, then it's where we actually will be thinking these kind of thoughts a lot. So this will be reduced, but it'll be still there. It won't, be, it won't go away totally. And this is where we have to get more refined in our sila because we're on the level of the mental. So these, these three aspects of, of the mind are the most hardest to, uh, to, uh, to straighten because they're happening in our own mind. Nobody sees it. We're thinking about them all the time or sometimes. Uh, and, and that way we have to be aware of our thoughts, the Lord Buddha said. The Lord Buddha says, yes, it's possible to read other people's minds, to see other people's mind. But if you're not skilled in that, then don't, be, don't worry. He said, don't worry. If you're not skilled in that, be skilled in another thing. And what is that? Reading your own mind. Okay? Really learn to read your own mind. And this is what the this is what Sheila is about. We're really looking at our own mind with circumspect and seeing our behavior. And it's wonderful because we live in a social context. And this is the whole idea of Buddhism. It's not we're in a cave alone and uh, we don't want to see anyone. No, this is how we purify ourselves in the social context with our families, friends and so forth. The same with monastics. We live in a monastic uh, environment and we're also working on that level of the monastics which is a much more refined sila. <clears throat> so the, the third aspect is this classic list that I told you at the very start which I now will uh, go into and that is he holds wrong view and he has this incorrect perspective of of thus, which this was a tr traditionally understood in India, that's why we don't hear it much. And there is nothing given, there is nothing sacrificed, and there's nothing offered. This is the first aspect, and that deals with dana and generosity, meaning there's, no, there's nothing given, so there's no point in doing it, no point in being generous. It's just basically saying that. And there is no fruit or result of good or bad actions. Again, because there's no fruit, well, there's, what's the point of doing wholesome activity? There's no fruit, okay? See, you now we can see what's directly, what it's, what it's implying when we have wrong view. There is no this world, no other world. Again, it's a, a, you know, annihilation kind of view, you know, a materialist kind of view, a hedonist kind of view, these, these words, hedonist, materialistic. It's like, I'm going to get as much as I can, I'm going to get as far as I can, I'm going to go for it and get as much excitement, fun and pleasure. And this is what society actually is promoting, you know. This kind of, yeah, buy the latest car, do this, get in debt, doesn't matter, just enjoy, 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 and over and over again. So the mind is as well creating a lot of guan mai pramad, not heedful, as we say in the Thai language. Very, very, one who is heedless, not being careful, not restraining oneself, considering things. And then further, there is no mother, father, and there are no being spontaneous born. And this is, this is saying that we're not giving importance to mother and father. So and we can see that in modern societies, mum and dad's in the nursing home or at home and nobody's, uh, and you're seeing it in newspapers a lot, that, that nobody's going to visit them and they're dead. They've been dead for two weeks and the son hasn't gone to see them and they're elderly. So there's that aspect as well. You know, you know well, you know, she gave birth to me, fine, but I don't need her, you know, fine. But we don't see the important significance where the Lord Buddha says mother and father, even if we were to carry them on our shoulders for the rest of our lives, uh, cook the meals for them, look after them, clean them, put on their clothes, do everything like we do for our little children for the rest of our lives, still it would be not enough to pay back that debt of gratitude. And the Lord Buddha says there's only one way we can pay our debt of gratitude to our mother and father, and that is bringing them in line with Dharma. You know, making them, uh, uh, promoting them to do good, promoting to be a good person. So let's say not every mother, not everyone's mum and dad is, you know, quite, you know, might be rough. Well, me, some children are very refined. It could be the other way. The mother and father are very refined, but the children are very rough. Sometimes it's karma. We just don't know the workings of karma. Each individual has his stock of karma. So, but, but being in that environment of a positive environment, someone who's very negative can also improve greatly. So this is the thing, we can reduce all those negative aspects of previous karma. 
So this is why we can see it's very detailed. It goes very far. It's very precise. Again, this is you know, uh, Lord Buddha, his precision in his teachings. And of course, this is not said much because Lord Buddha sort of, well, this is assumed by our society. I don't need to say it much. But now and then we're lucky that monks actually recorded this. I'm very grateful because that shows how much gets lost from ancient history. So preserving the scriptures in their pristine quality really is very beneficial because we can understand Dharma in its very purity form. Um, and then there is uh, this world, uh, there is, oh sorry, we're going in a negative aspect, there are in the world no ascetics, no Brahmins, meaning monks and so forth, of right conduct and right practice who have who having realized, who have not realized this world or the other world. So it's just saying, you know, especially monks in particular who have transcended the Dharma, have reached the stage of Arahant or something like that. And, uh, and you find out later when they pass away, the monks uh, know of his great attainments. And then you, that's why these bookshelves are full of books talking about all these deceased monks who are, let's say, Arahants or these great masters, and we have pictures of them and so forth. Um, particularly, this monk was a who was a very well-practiced monk, he passed away and I'm just honouring him because uh, he's a very respected monk in Thailand, so I'm just keeping a picture for my own purpose as a monk to show that respect until they cremate him, which is in next year, which they do for these great monks. So it's a great honour for me to do that. I feel very happy I can uh, do that for uh, honouring uh, this aspect of Dharma, which is just saying this very important, very important aspect. And this is also showing that people don't have confidence in the Lord Buddha as well. This is what it's basically saying. I don't have confidence. I'll take an intellectual understanding. I'll read it, but I don't really believe in it. And so then why should I believe it? I haven't seen it for myself. And the Kalama Sutta, where a lot of people read it and they don't read it deeply, they say, you know, um, just because it's written, I don't have to believe in it. You know, and they have this attitude. So they don't have this attitude of correct understanding. They don't have to believe it. I'll just think about it. But what that is doing as a final thing, when they're saying like that, um, they're basically saying to themselves, okay, there is not, there's nothing given, or I'm not too sure about that, or um, one is expected to cultivate unwholesome states because they're pramad, you know, they're guamai pramad. They're not, uh, they're not heedful, they're not careful with things. And why is that? Because they don't see the danger and degradation of defilement. So then they're saying, oh, you know, there's... There's no uh, nothing given, nothing offered. There's, there's no fruit results of good and bad actions. So there's a saying, you know, you know there's, there's no danger in it. I can do it. It's fine. There's not going to be any repercussions. So I can do what I want. It's fine. Don't care. And, uh, and because of that, uh, they don't see wholesome states, the quality of wholesome states. And what the Lord Buddha says, that they have this blessing of renunciation and the aspect of cleansing. Okay. And now we can see that quite clearly, how I've been explaining that. So when we don't harm beings, we say definitely with our body, I won't harm beings. Then in our mind, when we don't harm, then when we are presented with beings that we don't like, then we're not harming. We have this understanding compassion arise. You know, the non-harming and the non-doing. The Lord Buddha didn't say, have compassion. He's, he allowed the mind to have this transformation. And that's why now there's all these teachings now, be compassion, be this and be that. But actually, that's not correct. It's actually the non-doing. What will arise when you take away that object that is harm, you take that away, you have this empty space. Then the what will present itself is compassion. Because you're taking away that force, that power to hurt. Okay. So then someone on that aspect also will hold wrong view and one's intentions will be based wrongly and one's speech and statements will be wrongly, and then he'll conv convince others to follow this wrong way of understanding. And doing so, what does he do? He praises himself and disparages others. This is the natural consequence, knock-on effect, by someone who is established in wrong view. Oh, it doesn't matter. I can do what I want. It's fine. You know, it doesn't really matter. I can and be like that. And that's one extreme. He says, what is, what is to be expected, Lord Buddha? This is not for sure, but this is most likely the outcome, the Lord Buddha says, for most people. Other people may say they already have a quality of virtue, but they don't understand it. They're just naturally quite uh, uh, well-mannered because of good training from family, environment, but they don't believe in Buddhism, they don't believe in view. They could be still very moral. And then you have a lot of people like that, very morally upright, but they don't believe it. 
but also, uh, but that is uh, under certain cause and conditions, that could degenerate very greatly because that's only supported in a superficial level, not really in their heart, okay? So where we look at Buddhists so deeply rooted in Buddhists, such as say, say classical Sinhalese or classical Asian cultures where they've been from birth from many generations in Buddhism, they straight away, when they give, they give and they have joy because it's deeply rooted, you know, they have this important understanding, there is what is given, there is what is sacrificed, and there is what is offered, it has meaning. They understand when they're doing that. With people still giving, on, I don't know, I'll give, I don't know what's going to happen from it, they don't believe, because their mind is so confused with ideas, they're not really established in Dharma practice, they don't have support, they don't have a Dharma background environment, and so forth. So we can have a lot of compassion for people who are doing uh, who, are, who, are, who, who are, you know, trying to do dana, learn from it, you know, especially in particular Westerns, I try to encourage them, it's great, they're doing it. You should support them as much as possible because uh, it's something, their own decision, they do it. So a big and more enough for them because it's not very much uh, uh, engaged or taught in their, in their circular friends or around their social environment. So. Uh, so you can see Singhalese saying, yeah, I really feel Buddhism deep in my heart. You know, I really, you know, have so much faith and confidence. It's excellent. So it just shows their, their high level of, you know, dedication to Dharma practice. And then now is the opposite effect, which is going into the good qualities. And of course, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going over time, but it's very hard to go even, you can see how refined it is, yes? I've only gone for a little bit. I could have gone very quickly without any points of reference. And it just shows you how difficult it is to teach Dharma because it is such a refined thing. And that, uh, and at the level what Sariputta taught is very on a very high level. So uh, it does need time to discuss. And even the time of the Buddha, the, they would ask Mahakanchana, which is a very famous uh, disciple of the Buddha, who could, he was foremost in expounding in, in what Buddha said in brief into detail. So the monks would go saying, what, what did it, Lord Buddha mean by that in detail? And he would say, why telling me? You were there listening to the Buddha. Why didn't you ask him then? <laughs> so, oh, we were too afraid to. <laughs> like people now, no difference. We're no different, really. And, and the Lord Buddha did say there's this quality which does help to increase wisdom, that is asking questions. If we have some doubt or confusion, we should ask them. It's for our own benefit. Don't be shy if it's something really you're struggling with. So now I'll have to stop, but I think it's, I've gone through the most important aspect, that is the unwholesome. Now with that, we're understanding the unwholesome, then it's just the, the direct opposite, which is the wholesome. So all those qualities, if we are promoting wholesome, basically it's the same list. There's only a little bit variation in it, and that's promoting wholesome qualities. And so if we promote all those wholesome qualities right up to the last ones of right view, fixed in right view, so if we could just finish off with right view, there is given, there is what is sacrificed, there is what is offered, there is fruit and result of good and bad actions, there is this world or another world, there is mother and father, there is being spontaneously born, and there in this world there are ascetics, brahmins, right contact, right practice, having realised the world and the other world with direct knowledge. And now, thus they make it known for others. And this is what is directly saying what the Lord Buddha did. Out of compassion, he taught the world. So, and this is why, you know, Lord Buddha 2,500 years ago, so forth, is incredible that it still exists today, the Dharma, pristine condition, and it still exists a lineage of monks. It's wonderful. It just shows how important Dharma is over the ages and preserved it. And it's a very important quality, which I'll finish off with, when you're developing sila, which is also very, not very much taught, and that is the quality of that uh, when, when we develop sila and we, we arrive at right view, then we are devoid of longing, devoid of ill will, and, un, then, and do not have confusion. We see clearly every, every, and ever mindful. So basically that is saying that in a beautiful way, ida bhikkhava gaya gaya no pasibirati, it's saying the same thing in a different way, and it's just beautiful. And I just found that as a real gem. And I thought, oh, that's the same one, but it's said in a different way. And that's how a lot of the Lord Buddha's teaching he says the same thing, but he says a little bit different, just to keep it interesting. Because Sila is quite boring. Oh no, here's a talk on Sila. Oh no, I've got to do good, don't do bad. You're a bad boy, like that. I don't want to hear it. And I used to ask myself that too when I was a young man. I used to think, you know coming from a Christian background, 
couldn't see the point of it. You know, what's the big deal? I didn't go to bed. I didn't see the consequences, you know, and, you know, and, and Christ on the cross and things like this and <laughs> going to heaven, you know, promise of going to heaven. But when I, when I started really studying the Dharma, it really made sense when I matured. And I can see actually it is a very, very mature approach to actually understand, you know, good and bad in its, in its depth and its repercussions and it, what it means, what I'm doing, what I'm promoting, what I'm doing. So it's very powerful. So I will, in the next talk I will do, there's quite a lot of material I haven't worked through, so I'll continue on with that theme, okay? A little bit more, in more detail. And it just shows you how very refined it is. So it looks like a lot of you were interested and got some benefits and made some things. So now we'll give a time. Before I do, just finally with that last bit, I was saying having devoid of longing, devoid of ill and all those qualities, then what happens, one is at peace. So then when one sits meditation, the first thing that can actually present itself in the mind when one is very firm in mindfulness is that one can pervade the one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise, a second, likewise, a third. So in front of us, to the side, to the left, above, below, and around, and everywhere. So, so our mind is expanding. It's a quality expansion. And this is what is when we embody of Dharma, we have these Dharma qualities where there's no regret, no more. There's this complete uh, purity of mind because we, uh, we've really cleansed our mind and our bodily actions, our verbal actions, and our mental actions to a very refined level. Then this is what will present itself as a natural effect. So, this is a real gem I found going through doing a lot of research. And then, and then, then all these qualities. Thus, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. So, just showing these are the most heaviest roots, and uh, and the ones that cause the most harm is that is the root of hatred, is the most potentially the most dangerous of the three. There's also desire, which is dangerous, and delusion. But so this one we understand as Buddhists, we should avoid hatred as much as possible, avoid expressing anger. Um, because that is very damaging to the mind, extremely, and it's almost, there's no, no, no chance, no possibility of becoming peaceful at all. So, uh, so I hope to, uh, and a Mordana, for you coming to listen, and I hope this was beneficial for your training, further training in sati, and developing mindfulness and using it as a great vehicle, what the Lord Buddha says, uh, is something as a good foundation. So even if we are getting really good at our sati practice, we can always come back to this and test it out to see if it is really in line with Dharma, okay? Because it is sama sati, yeah? You know, there's a lot of people saying, I'm mindful loading my gun, yeah? It's a bit dangerous when you hear things like that. <laughs> I'm mindful playing, playing, uh, playing uh, Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, this is what we have to, we have to not, uh, of course, I'm not making a joke, but I'm, there's a bit of, a bit of, a bit of truth what I'm saying there.